morning. It's good to see you all. Thanks for that. Well, uh, I couldn't hesitate but call the title of the message Nick at Night, though I'm not into titles. But as a millennial, uh, growing up in Elk Grove, California, I distinctly remember Christmas breaks and summer vacations playing GameCube with my buddies all night long. Uh, And there would be times that we would stay up and watch Cartoon Network's Adult Swim or Nickelodeon's Nick at Night. Uh, We loved the shows because they transported us into the shows that my parents watched. uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, Friends, uh, the Andy Griffith show. Barney was always an interesting character. But all of those shows transported us into kind of a time that we've never even heard of. I remember my buddies and I loved to watch the shows because I think they hearkened back to a simpler time. Uh, There are real themes that were developed. And as I was preparing for this message, I asked the question, does anyone even watch Nick at night anymore? Turns out that the the program is still going strong. And I think perhaps the reason it's still going strong is because there's something about the classic shows that deal with life's themes and its trials and triumphs with a certain clarity. And I don't know if we're going to have a TiVo, TV land, or a Nick at Night in heaven, but I suggest if we did, the text in front of us would be part of the classic program. For what we see in John chapter 3 is none other than a classic text throughout Christian history. A text that speaks simply about what really it means to be a Christian. A text that is as memorable as its character, and a text that is as useful today as it was then. Will you take your Bible with you and will you open it to John chapter 3? If you need a Bible, there should be one down in the seat. Uh, There should also be the page number on the back of your bulletin. This is John chapter 3. Um, We're actually going to start in John 2, 23 through 25, but uh, for my note takers, uh, I'm going to handle this really in three sections. I'm going to look at the sadness of our condition. Then I'm going to look at what the new birth is. Then we're going to look at the man who makes the birth possible. The sadness of man's condition, the new birth, and the man that makes the birth possible. Let's begin first with the sadness of our condition. Yet before we speak of our condition, we have to ask and study what the condition was of the people who Jesus ministered to. John tells us in his prologue that all of mankind is in darkness, and that Jesus is the one light who comes into the world. But as I think about that theme of light and darkness, what we see in the condition of Jesus' original audience was that there was a spiritual blindness that was around. Often, the spiritual blindness showed itself in that people would believe in the things that Jesus did, and yet these signs that were to point to Jesus actually began to obscure who he was. You see, they didn't really believe in Jesus as Lord, but more Jesus as wonder worker. Jesus, knowing that, often dealt with that false belief and would not entrust himself to people. Take a look how John says it. Look at verses 23 through 25 in John chapter 2. John tells us, Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. And therein like we see the situation at hand. It's that people believed in Christ, and yet their belief was based on something else. If you're able, go quickly to John chapter 6 and look at verse 14 and 15. You remember this scene, Jesus does a wonder. He breaks out the best sandwich and fish and chips you could have asked. And it's so good, and people love it so much that they fall in love with Christ, and they believe in his name. And yet, despite the fact that they claim to believe, Jesus sees that they believed not in him as Lord and Savior, but believed in him as a man who can do things for themselves. Listen to the way John explains it in verse 14 and 15. He said, After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, 
withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And so one of the situations we see within the place Jesus ministers to is a spiritual blindness that causes people to be excited about the performances of Christ and yet miss the man himself. And yet, in spite of as sad as that is, when we look at Nicodemus, we see an even sadder condition. For what we see is a man who has much in the eyes of the world, a man who has much in the eyes of his heritage. And yet, for all that he has, we find that he is yet hollow inside. What we'll see in Nicodemus is a religious man, a proud man, and yet an empty man. Take a look at the way John explains him in verse three. Of, I'm sorry, in chapter three of verse one, it says, "Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council." We're told that he's a Pharisee. This, these are the group of people who believe that the reason Israel was in the situation they were was because they failed to follow God's law all throughout the ages. And so for the Pharisee party, their way to get back was to get back to the law, to check and how many times one has sinned, to count how many times one has done sacrifices. And for their uh, vision, religion would be the way to get back to God. This is the person in church who always has the Bible verse for everything. Now, don't worry, I'm that kind of guy, so I get it. This is the one who always... uh, counts and lets you know the kind of spiritual things they're doing. And yet Nicodemus, being a religious Pharisee, is a man who trusts in the law. And yet, despite the fact that he's a Pharisee, we also see that he is a proud man. He has much in the eyes of the world. He has power, not just fake power, but real power. Look at the way John says it. He calls him a member of the Jewish ruling council. That means he's a Supreme Court justice, that kind of uh, clout. He pulls that kind of weight. He exercises that kind of influence over Israel. People looked at him. And yet, for all of his religion and his power, there's another detail that John tells us that even elevates Nicodemus among the rulers. Take a look at what Jesus says to him in verse 10. Do you see what he calls him? Israel's teacher. In other words, Nicodemus is not just a ruler, but he is of the creme, the cream that rises to the top. He is the best teacher among the best, the one who gives an interpretive opinion. It's as if when Nicodemus speaks, we listen. A very controversial example, though I think it's one of the best, uh, as we, if, we, if we think of COVID, we could think of Dr. Fauci. Now, whether or not you believe that him or not, the truth that we can all agree is that he was put forth as the expert. And whether or not we agree with him, people live their life based upon what he said. They would not trust other thoughts unless it came from him. I use that example because Nicodemus exercised that kind of of clout, that kind of power, that kind of esteem. And yet, despite having all that in the world, what we find is that he is yet still an empty man. You see, because for all the things he has in the world, he misses who Jesus really is. Take a look at what John says and how he approaches in verse 2. Do you see that key? He came to Jesus at night. Now, Theologians have ran their motors dry to try to find what this means. And I think perhaps the best interpretation is what we can imagine. To imagine a man with that kind of weight, that kind of clout, that kind of trust, to be seen in public with this interesting rabbi, Jesus Christ, would be to commit social suicide. It would be the kind of thing that the Jews would say, what are you doing hanging out with that guy. And yet Nicodemus, instead of approaching Christ with his need, comes in a clandestine manner, interested in Jesus, and yet still not knowing who Jesus is. Notice what he calls him. You see? Does he call him Lord? No, he calls him the what? 
a teacher, a rabbi, which is only a half-truth. And yet, if anyone would call Jesus teacher, it's not enough. But the only way to truly come to Christ is to see him as more than just a teacher. And yet, for all of what Nicodemus has, for its greatness in the world, it actually blinds him. For he comes at night not wanting to associate. He sees a portion of Jesus, but he misses who Jesus is. And yet, here, we see that he is yet still an empty man. Take a look at what Jesus says to him in verse 3. Cutting through the BS, going straight to the jugular, Jesus says this in verse 3. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom unless... Uh, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. In other words, he's like as if, as if Jesus was a New Yorker. He cuts through the small talk and just says, here's your problem. You're empty. You're not saved. You need something else. And as we look at the condition of the crowd that Jesus dealt with and the condition of Nicodemus, it shows us something of the sadness of mankind's condition today. And the truth is really a warning for us, brothers and sisters, that we must protect against the spiritual blindness that we can have. While we can be saved, we can put bad things into our eye and miss what Jesus wants for us. As a pastor, an example that I see often, and one of the ways that we can be spiritually blinded is by blind, being blinded by personal ambition. In other words... We can think that the visions for our life are the very same things that Jesus has for us. And over time, we can pursue something and yet think something that started out in our mind is the exact same thing that God wants. Spoke to a brother in this church last week, and he shared with me of a sister-in-law he had, who throughout her whole life wanted to be a professor. That's what she pursued. And throughout her bachelor's and her master's and her PhD, every single time she went to the next room, into the next room, she saw it more and more as God's destined plan for her. As if her faith and her position as being a professor were one and the same. But you know what happened, don't you? By the time she got her professorship, she went to look for roles and found nothing. Interview after interview after interview, she didn't find the job. And she began to be greatly troubled, cast down by her faith. What's interesting is that though she didn't get these professor jobs, God still elevated her job in the education realm. Because even though she didn't get these professorships, what she did grow in is she grew in administration. So she was blessed, but she couldn't see it. She was so destined to want to be this thing that over time she believed her personal ambition in Christ's vision for her life were one in the same. We can do that, can't we? We can be presumptuous, and we must also watch out that our personal ambitions in Christ's vision for our life may be different. And for those of us, you may be waiting on something Loved one, it could be that maybe God is going to give it to you when you're ready, when he's ready, but it also could be that maybe God doesn't have that for you. But how we respond when our plans get thwarted shares a lot of what really we're seeing. Let us not be blinded by personal ambition. Second, another challenge we can have is trusting in the wrong things. Nicodemus trusted in what? He had the greatest thing anyone can have, his Jewishness. He was not only Jewish, he was uh, the ruler, he was the teacher. From all externals, if there was anyone who was a child of God, it had to be him. And yet, as a Bronco fan, I can tell you that I can trust in Russell Wilson to get me to the playoffs, that it ain't happening. And so this NFL season has taught me that you can't trust in the wrong things. And yet, as funny as an example as that is, as a bunch of Seahawks fans laugh that they've fleeced us, the truth is, is we can look towards external things to determine if we're saved or not. We can look at our church attendance and think, hey, I'm doing pretty good. We can look at what our parents said about us, that they know that we made a confession of faith. 
that we can hold on to a prior baptism that we had as the true mark of whether we've been really born again. And yet before us is what we see, the sadness of the condition that we're in, is that mankind is spiritually blind and is apt to either trust in the wrong things or to make their personal ambitions God's personal ambition. Let us watch out for that. We now see the sadness of our condition. Let us now look at the new birth itself. Yet upon Nicodemus being slapped in the head with that comment that he needs something else, we see his response in verse 4. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. In this text, I want to show you three things of the new birth. First, I want you to see that the new birth results in a complete transformation. Look at how Jesus explains it in what he says in verse 5 through 7. He says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Now here's the key to me. Verse 7. He looks at Nicodemus and says, you should not be surprised at this. And yet Nicodemus is. What's the point Jesus is making is that while the new birth is new, it's actually an old idea. It's already rooted in the scriptures and it results in a complete transformation. Now, I've thought about this and the best text to my mind that I believe Jesus thought of when he spoke to Nicodemus was Ezekiel 36. 24 through 27, I'll show it to you here. In Ezekiel 36, 24 through 27, what we come against is uh, yet a prophet who speaks of a time where Israel will be restored. And there's a promise that's given, and it says it like this, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. What I want you to see here is a few things about the new birth. First is that it reveals what we need. And that is that the promise of a new heart, which by contrast says what? Our heart is bad. We are in need of cleansing. And so God makes a promise that there's going to be a transformation and that you will love the things that God loves, which by contrast means what? Do we naturally love the things he loves? No, but rather we love the things we love. And so God says, I need to replace that. Second, in in regards to a, a new heart, we will secondly get a new spirit. We will get a new spirit. A spirit that the Bible says will be able to follow God, uh, to understand his laws and to understand his rules and follow them without problem. And then God will be with us. And what I want you to see here is that this new birth is different. It's a complete transformation. As I thought about this, it made me think about our culture. Often the gospel of the culture is not a new you, but a better version of you, isn't it? It's not to uh, be transformed, but to be one step better. Uh, To be wealthier, to be sexier, to be smarter. And embedded in that seems to be the difference between Christianity and the world. Is that our faith says that the problem is deep on the inside. And that a a washing is not enough, but a complete transformation is necessary. Whereas the culture seems to say that what we have is just okay. Therein lies the difference. The culture tells us that we're born good. And we need to become a better version of us. And yet the scriptures tell us the truth is that we need not a better version, but a new version. A version that can actually be what God wants us to be. And it's so drastic that the only way to get it is to do a complete do-over, to be born again. And so what we see in the new birth is a complete transformation that is required. And yet second, and this is honestly the most 
comforting but disheartening part is that the new birth is God's idea and God's idea alone. Take a look at what Jesus says in verse 8, this puzzling kind of thing he says to Nicodemus. He talks about the wind, and he says it like this, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. What's the idea here? The idea is that God likens the Spirit of God to wind, and what he says is that the wind does what it wants. To use a slang term, the wind is a boss. Uh, the wind shows up. I've never had the wind reach out to let me know that it's coming. Matter of fact, some of you are like me. You're dressed well. You have your fresh seersucker short sleeve shirt, and you're walking down the waterfront thinking how great a day it is. And then all of a sudden you hear, Shh, and now you wish you would have brought your Columbia. The wind just says, hey, I'm here. I do what I want. Or living in San Francisco, walking down, oh, Fisherman's Wharf with the $8 ice cream cone in hand. You know, the one. And as you're licking it, you're watching out for the seagulls, and then the wind comes and ice cream cone off. Penguins need to be fed. The wind does what it wants. What's the idea here? The idea is that this new birth is God's thing. He gives it to who he wants to give it to. He does it in the way he wants to have it done. And we're not sure how, and for Nicodemus, what the point is that Nicodemus, this isn't something you can earn. Nicodemus, this isn't something that your success in the eyes of people can get you. It's a gift that you need, and yet there's nothing you can do to get it. It's rather given by God and God alone. Yet at the same time, I see an application here for us in the church. And what I see here is that this tells us that God accepts you in spite of your sins. Don't miss that. If the new birth is God's thing, and it is, and he gives it to those who he wants to, and he does, then that must mean that for all who have it, God accepts you in spite of who you are. Which means that when you blow it again in your anger, and you feel conviction about your anger, that's good because God wants to reform your anger. But don't think that God's acceptance of you is dependent on how angry you get. It's rather just he loves you. Or in our own life, when it's been a month and we haven't communed with the Lord in prayer and the word, and we begin to feel that kind of drifting that can occur, we could think, oh man, maybe something's wrong, and you feel a type of conviction. That's good. Because God wants to have life with you and wants to help you experience the joy. But God's acceptance of us, brothers and sisters, is not dependent upon how many chapters we read in the Bible. But rather, it's a spiritual gift that he gives. And because he's given it to you, it means that he accepts you in spite of who you are. In spite of who I am. am. And yet, as I look at this text, I see the hope and I also see a challenge, though. Take a look at verse 8 again. After all this talk of the wind doing what he wants, there's a thing Jesus says. He says, you hear its sound. You see that? You hear its sound. And what's the idea? Even though the wind is sovereign, even though the wind does what it wants, it can be felt, can't it? The one who wears his short sleeve shirt can feel the ice of the wind come up his spine. The person who walks in the fall day can feel the cool of the wind touch their nose. The wind can be experienced. And in this text, I see a challenge for us in the church. While the hope is that God accepts us in spite of our sin, the challenge is that our life is the proof of whether we are truly born again or not. Our life is the proof of whether we're born again. This is a text that's greatly convicted me this week. This, position, this point exactly. For I grew up in trusting all these other external things and church attendance and tithes that I give. And yet what we see is that people ought to experience something in our life. When people interact with us, there needs to be like the wind, an experience that they can say something is different. As I think about that, I want to give you kind of the test, the true test, the scriptural test as to whether 
you can judge your life by. Jesus gives us one, rather the Holy Spirit does, through the Apostle Paul found in Galatians 5, the fruit test. What we see here are the acts of the flesh. And he says it like this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yet at the same time, there's now the fruits. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now look at 24. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Which practically means this. It's not that Christ wants perfection. Yet, like a tree that bears fruit, over time it should be that we're bearing more of this. The question becomes, as we look in our life, are we bearing this over time? As you look at 5 and 10 and 15 years, does it seem like it's more of this or is it more of this? This is the test that God gives us in his word. This is what Nicodemus so shocked him, is that his ethnicity, his position among people, his respect gave him all the external signs that he was truly born of God. And yet Jesus says he was not because he was in missing the very spiritual birth that he needed. And so what we see is that while the spiritual birth tells us that God accepts all of us in spite of our sin, it also ought to be in our life that we are growing in these fruits of the Spirit. As I told you, this greatly convicted me this week. Uh, as I looked at my life, I saw areas where there was a lack of love, a lack of joy. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit brought that to my mind, but I see now how important it is that over time, I and you be growing in the spiritual fruit of Christ. And so what we see now about the new birth is that it's God's idea, that it's a complete transformation, that God accepts us in spite of who we are, but for those who have it, the life needs to be felt. When people interact with you, do they feel something of Christ? I remember a brother who told me of a cousin he had who went to seminary, got into seminary, graduated seminary, and never could find the right church. Every church he went to, he couldn't settle on one. He found problems with it. And he mourned the fact that uh, unlike his seminary experience where everyone, quote unquote, understood the matters of Christ, he couldn't find a church because everyone seemed to have issues. I now understand the sadness of that is that like Nicodemus, you can get your education and yet still be hollow. You cannot find a church. And you know why the reason he didn't find it? Because ultimately there was something in him that didn't have that forbearance to forbear with people who don't look like you, that didn't have the love for people's imperfections, that didn't have the gentleness to look past what people do in the church. And rather, he would go at every church and never settle in one. And I'm convinced now the reason, because he, like some, were hollow on the inside. He didn't have the fruit. And so here we see the new birth in question. We've seen the new birth. We've now seen the sadness of our condition. And while the new birth is God's idea, and we don't know really how he does it, we don't know when he does it, we do know two things about it. We know why he did it, and we know how to get it. Let us now look at the man who gives us the new birth. After looking at this, uh, G Nicodemus, you feel bad for the guy. After this a beat down he's taking in verse 9 he says how can this be he's thought he was a phd and in the name of christ he's found to be a pre-k he's still grasping on elementary truth and yet he's writing commentary for all of israel jesus first 
tells to them, you're Israel's teacher and you don't understand this? And then here in verses 11 and 12, we see the challenge that people have in coming to Christ. And that is that the gospel in itself, the new birth, is at most an offense to people. Look at what Jesus says to him in verse 11. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know. We testify to what we've seen. But still, you people don't accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things. You don't believe it. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? The idea here is that Nicodemus understands, but he doesn't accept it. You know what's hard? We're looking at kind of a Bible character here, and sometimes we can think in our mind we're in Bible land uh, and think that these characters are kind of, at least in my mind, sometimes I forget that these are real people. And as we look at Nicodemus, what do we see? For all intents and purposes, this is a successful man, is it not? I mean, this man is gifted. This man is respected. This man has power, prestige. This is the valedictorian, the Ivy League, the kind of guy who has been a blue blood his whole life. And the problem is what happens when you're used to getting and succeeding and going through the ranks. Think about how hard it is to realize that you're not good enough. That's the reason Nicodemus can't take it is because the gospel at its heart is an admission that there's something in us that's not good enough, that we need something more. Paul the Apostle, when he was talking to his Corinthian church, as I say, the Jerry Springer of the New Testament church, he tells them the challenge of the gospel is that to those who have it, it's great. But to those who don't have it, it seems foolish. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul says it like this. Oh, where is it? He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are dying. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jesus says it in a different way. It's hard for a rich man. And the idea is that the challenge with having much in this world is that it can help you believe that you really are the reason for your success. And then to hear that you must come and admit defeat, that there's something wrong with you, is not a message that's exciting to hear. And so the sadness of Nicodemus is this offense is too great. But despite that, Jesus graciously and truthfully shows us and shows him how to get it. Verse 3, after explaining all this, go back to verse 14. Jesus kind of says this. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life in him. That's very important. Go with me to Numbers 21, verse 4 through 9. What Jesus is saying is he's telling Nicodemus a Jew his whole life. And you remember that scene back in the Exodus? That's who I am. In Numbers 21, 4, I'll do some context for you. Israel's doing the Israel thing. Getting excited, then sinning, getting impatient, asking for forgiveness, then sinning again. And in this one moment, they get so frustrated that God, or that God gets so frustrated that he finally judges them by killing some. In Numbers 21, 4, it says it like this. Israel traveled with Moses along the route of the Red Sea. But the people got impatient with Moses and God. And they spoke against Moses and said, why would you bring us up out of Egypt? In other words, why are we doing this? There's no bread. There ain't no water. We detest this miserable food. Get a cook in here. Verse 6, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. Verse 7, this is extremely important. The people then came to Moses and said, We've sinned against you and God. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. The Lord then said to Moses, Make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone who's bitten at it can look and live. And so Moses made a bronze snake, put it up on a pole. Then when anyone who was bitten by a snake looked at the bronze snake, they lived. 
What we see, brothers and sisters, is how to, to come to Christ. First, what we see in Jesus' point that just as the snake was lifted up, we traditionally as Christians know that this pointed forward to Jesus' cross, that when he was lifted up to save mankind in their sin. And yet, as I look at the contrast between Nicodemus and Israel, we see very important truths on how to achieve the new birth. Nicodemus came at night, interested in Christ as a teacher, yet still wanting to be at home in his world. Israel, after being bitten by a snake, how did they come? At the end of themselves. You see what they say? We've sinned, Lord, against you and against Moses. There's an acknowledgement that they're sick. We traditionally call that what? The R word of repentance. They come at the end ready to admit that they need help. Nicodemus still comes at night. And we see that for brothers and sisters here and for those friends who don't know the Lord. If you would go and get the new birth, you must first come to Christ openly. Not like Nicodemus, but ready to admit you need help. Second, we see that after coming to them, they look up at the bronze snake. And yet as they look up at the bronze snake, they live. Nicodemus comes at night, yet when he looks at Jesus, does he see God? Does he see a savior? What is the term that he calls him when he sees him? Teacher. He sees him as an example Another one of these rabbis who has some things to teach, but he doesn't see them as the savior of the world. Friend, if you would come to Christ, make no mistake that you can't come to him as just a teacher. But you must come to him openly and acknowledge him as savior. And believing and truthfully trusting that when Christ hung on the cross, he took the pain, the penalty of our sin. Having seen that, we have to naturally ask the question, why? Why did Jesus do this? Why did God the Father go through all this? What is this whole new birth about? What John tells us is he pulls back and he says, the ultimate reason that God did this, the ultimate reason that the new birth was possible and is available was because God loves people. Take a look at how he says it in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they haven't believed in the name of God's one and only son. The ultimate reason God gave the new birth is because of people's love, his love for them. How do we get it? By coming to Jesus openly, by trusting in him as more than a teacher but our savior. And I'm encouraged to find out something, that Nicodemus didn't get it in this moment. He didn't see it. He left. But John tells us that at some point he got it. In John 19, after Jesus hung on the cross, Nicodemus must have, must have put the two and two together. And it says that after being hung on the cross, we're told that later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. In other words, listen, he's dead. Can we take him? Can we give him a proper burial? Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders, he wouldn't come out. And so Pilate gave him Jesus' body to embalm and to give a proper burial to and yet we're told he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus then took some aloes and perfume and embalmed the body. He didn't see it that night, but by the grace of Jesus, he finally saw it. He finally made the connection. And while he first came to Jesus at night, not wanting to Identify with Jesus. Here, imagine the scene in front of all of his Jewish leaders who put the Lord to death. You see the teacher of Israel come out among them and care for the very man that they just murdered. 
Nicodemus is finally ready to identify with Christ. For in this moment, he saw Jesus as more than just a teacher. But in Jesus, he saw his Savior, the one that he looked at and his sins were forgiven. John tells us this truth this morning, that for all of this in the new birth, it is at its most a gift given by God. But it's not dependent on what we do or who we are, but rather it's God's idea. It results in a complete transformation, and it can be achieved when we come to Christ humbly and see him as our Savior. As we now finish with applications, I have an application for our unbelieving friends and for the church this morning. For those of us who don't know Christ, it's my and our church's earnest desire that you too would look unto Christ and see him as your savior. That you would come to him as Israel did, humbly admitting that you're sick and in need of help. That you would turn from your sins, trust in Christ, and believe. And yet for those of us who are in Christ, those of us who've been walking with Jesus for a while, the application for us is the same. For the unbeliever, it's looking and believing. For the believer, it's this. Do you still believe? Do you still trust that he is good enough? When life is changed or shifted and you look at him, do you still trust that his desire for your life is the right thing? Do you look at him and still see a savior when your plans fail? Will you trust him with the uncertainty of today? And yet in second, we see for the believer not only a desire to trust in him, but brothers and sisters, we must grow with him as well. In walking in our life with Christ, our life must be like the wind. And that people who come into this church can experience something of our love, something of our joy, and leave and believe in themselves that we have been with Jesus. And so as we close now, let us now see the truth that all may look unto Christ. For the church, that means trusting in him, growing in him. And for our unbelieving friends, that means believing and trusting him as Savior. I want to now invite our worship team up this morning. Thank you for your patience. And as they come up this morning, we're going to do what we traditionally do, which is to sit in response to what God has placed upon our heart. Again, there's the applications. For those of you who don't know Christ, uh, we'll be praying. Uh, Should you have questions about this message, feel free to see me or any of the elders in the fireside. And yet, for those of us in the church, do we trust him? Are we still ready to continue to grow with him so that people may see we've been with Jesus? Take your time with the Lord. I'll close us in prayer.